Number 10, the cholera belt. This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach indigestion and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The cholera belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that devil gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's what it does. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why. I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen. We love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love, I love the green screen. When I was a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects. They were for walls so weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shiel. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything, dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Oof. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that had wings, or I guess caprices, was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies. It actually looks kind of good, to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch. That's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one. That was nice. Number seven, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough. Life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything. The whole works. The crazy part is you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband passed, and it was obvious to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number six, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black. You need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah, I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dye, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb their skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't want that. Number five, zinc chlorine coats. This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend. Thank God. Picture this. It's Victorian London. London and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot, I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. 
And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that. Or your high school chemistry class it was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, asbestos fabrics. Chris will like this. He'll remember these. Picture this. It's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show. He's one of my favorites. Love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned and he says have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos then you may be qualified for compensation I believe it went something like that maybe I should call Saul Goodman where's he when you need him all jokes aside those commercials were not joking they weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time so yeah it was pretty bad Victorian times were no different, mostly using things to protect from heat or fire, and while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs, and like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous, hence mesotheliomia. I said it right there, I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is, mesothelioma. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because, yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches, you name it, radium was in it. While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine, not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain in this one except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup and they used it. And I, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful to you. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's, sorry, who's talking to me, what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so yeah, it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton, or a cotton-like product, is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I can't cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they'd probably set it off. That's how, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty crazy. More sensitive than your first day to prom, you know what I'm saying? At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number nine, tiny teeth. 
During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah, teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. Because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was five or six years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. At number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls 
skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Eye number four, five head. Let's go back to the renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. I suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. Item number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waists. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. And coming in at number 10, stiff collars. This early 1900s invention was accidental by nature, but seems absolutely painful just hearing about it. The detachable collar or stiff collar, created by Hannah Montague in New York in 1827, has been coined the father killer. <gasps> but why? Well, this stiff detachable collar is so stiff that men could die from just wearing it. Yeah, basically just rubbing your jugular up against it all day would restrict oxygen to the brain. You could pass out or even die. This man was killed by a collar! So basically your own collar is rear naked choking the shit out of you all day. I thought the tie was the worst part. Made out of usually a separate material to the shirt pinned onto, the removable, starched to absolute hell and back collar basically turns as a sharp and rigid on your neck as a knife. Pain is beauty, darling. Apparently men would fall asleep after a couple of drinks or succumb to a cat nap and sometimes not even wake up at all. Dressed to death. Literally. Number nine, mini bowler hats. Ah yes, are you tired of bowler hats fitting on your head properly? Are you stuck in the 1940s and you're now tired of regular sized, properly fitting bowler hats? 
Well, fear not, old heads. Introducing mini bowler hats. Yep, that right there, that right there is fashion, right there, folks. Take something that's already working and then just jazz it up, you know, just mess it up just a little bit. This look didn't last too long because only a few could pull it off, obviously. The hat wouldn't fit on your head. That was the whole point. A hat that isn't supposed to fit. It was always sideways and like dainty. It was kind of half off. Any swift breeze comes along, good game. The hat's gone. Now you're chasing a mini bowler hat down the road like it's a silent film. Whoa, <laughs> oops, sorry, my hat. Harper's Bazaar deemed the mini bowler hat one of the worst of the 1940s. Yeah, I see a lot of hats now that aren't on all the way. Drives me nuts, I just wanna, just wanna put it on. It's always like about to flap off. I'm like, you're gonna lose it, man. The wind's gonna come, you're gonna lose that hat. It's a nice hat. Number eight, bad teeth. If you've had a couple root canals like me and enjoy the taste and feel of your tongue ripped to shreds after a big old bag of sours, well, then this one's for you. Opposed to the nice, clean, white smile we all strive for today, back then the sight of bad teeth was actually, well, charming. It usually meant you had a lot of money. Ah, oh, those disgusting peasants and their hygiene. <sighs> teeth have a lifespan on their own, and the white discoloration from poor hygiene happens to all of us on its own. But the best method and the fastest method to ensure that those little chompers become stinky and brown, sugar. Which, if you were living anywhere between the 12th and 19th century, was very expensive and really hard to come by. So why the fashion craze? Well, it's got multiple purposes. For instance, in Southeast Asian cultures, blackening one's teeth, or the Japanese oha guro, was seen as both a beauty standard and a tooth preserver. This process would happen by coating the teeth in a mixture of goop, usually made out of iron, vinegar, and vegetable tannin to dye the teeth black. Queen Elizabeth is a great example of this beauty standard. She would basically just smash a sugar goop into her mouth every day to purposely destroy her teeth. The more infected and discolored the teeth, the better. Ew. Number seven, propeller hats. Okay, I'm coming for hats in this video, it seems. Sorry about that. Propeller hats in Super Mario, very practical. A lot of Goombas, sudden gusts of wind, plus a few warp pipes. You're gonna need a lift or two, right? Fair. The summer of 1947, not that windy, not that windy, folks. Not windy enough for propeller hats, I'll tell you that for free. Why are teens in the 40s wearing airport runway anemone eaters on their heads? Why, we don't need to know the wind velocity outside, just go eat some ice cream. Well, it started with a cartoonist named Ray Faraday Nelson. See, he used this propeller hat in a cartoon, and then later on at a sci-fi convention, he had the cartoon there with a real life propeller hat. And everyone was like, what, how? How did he just do that? This of course swept the nation just like the fidget spinner. Brands made their own versions, they hopped on the trend quickly. So quick in fact that Nelson never had time to even secure a patent for this new fresh idea. Yeah, it was too late. He didn't get a dime from the hats and we didn't get the gift of solo flight. So let's call it even, right? Number six, ruffs. With silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things. Taming of the Shrew, Act 4, Scene 3. Ah oh, yes, the theater and the rough. Well, not that rough, but quite literally theater in a rough. A rough, I sound like a dog. A rough, or also known as the Elizabethan collar, was an interchangeable piece of cloth that could itself be laundered separately while keeping the wearer's gown from not being soiled at the neckline. Long story short, no Chef Boyardee spilling out of your mouth and down onto your clothes. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. The stiffness of the garment forced upright posture and poise. Most ruffs could only be worn once due to its longevity and structure. Made out of a very fine material like silk, their light and delicate material, design and size led them to become a symbol of wealth and status amongst the upper class. There was even a time where blue dyed ruffs were against the law in England since it resembled Scotland's colours on its flag. It shall only be of two primary colours, yellow and blood. Oh, red, red, red. Number five, smoke break jackets. Here we go. Hey, remember Hugh Hefner? Yeah, not only did he treat women like shit, but he also dressed like it completely. Yeah, rather fitting if you ask me. Guy would wear a stinky maroon coloured jacket and then sit there and blow smoke in your face all night. What an icon, guy changed history. He would wear what's called a smoking jacket. That's what he was, that's what this garbage is. They were around in the 1600s, but they really peaked popularity in the 1920s when he was like 56 years old, you know what I mean? These jackets were designed for gentlemen. I mean, obviously, you know. You know, they were designed as bathrobes with class. They were made of this velvet cloth, perfect for soaking up cigar smoke and further accusations. God rest his soul. He really left his mark in history, didn't he? Number four, 
Corsets. Okay, we know literally everything about these things, but you don't, so listen up. If you have to put your foot in the middle of my back to lace me up, yeah, it's too tight. Or is it? A stiff and rigid piece of clothing that I could definitely use for my posture. The corset, first invented in Italy, then France, then England. The rigid posture and protective garment around the kidneys, ribs, and vital organs under a knight's armor were adopted for style, class, and shape. Most popularized during the 16th century, this slim and sleek look was adored and worn by all classes. The best way for a woman to shape her bust? A man's chest straight and high while riding. And a great way to lose consciousness. No, 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 I can breathe. Go, go a bit tighter. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Usually made out of something strong like whalebone or wood. The stitched corsets would maintain its hard shape and the wearer would basically just be stitched in for the entirety of the day. That sounds comfortable. Number three, hammer pants. Okay, look, Kyle and I were on a dance team or two growing up. We get it. Baggy pants, extra zippers, zippers that don't even have pockets, pockets that are far too shallow to hold even that of a chapstick. We get it, okay? We love a good pair of dance pants. The hammer pants from the 90s, I don't think that was it. We should have heeded MC Hammer's warning and not touched it, you know what I mean? The man turned 60 this year, so we have to now look back on the truth from him. MC Hammer himself has made it very clear. He says, quote, don't call them parachute pants. I detest the term, end quote. Yeah, man of few words, but you know what? When you sing that many songs, you don't need to speak anymore. Obviously, MC Hammer didn't invent this style, but it's funny to see him act like he did. You know what I mean? These types of trousers initially appeared in Persia, India, and Turkey thousands of years ago, but we love your bangers, MC Hammer. All three. Number two, Belladonna Drops. Growing up with bad vision, I've had some pretty weird things shoved into my eyes. Dirty fingers, drops, but never a scoop of berry jam. Nah, I kind of missed out on that one, I guess. Okay, maybe not jam, but the belladonna berries, though very toxic, had an unusual role in beauty standards in medieval Europe. Upon squishing this doughy-eyed remedy into your sockets, the persons, usually women's eyes, would dilate, resulting in huge, doughy puppy dog eyes, just running around town with blurred vision like you're about to get ophthalmologisted. E, M, L, four, nine, strawberry, raspberry, blueberry, that's not, okay, what, what? Of course, you wouldn't be able to see how good you looked per se, as if you've ever been dilated for optometrist reasons, then you know exactly what I mean. The belladonna or beautiful woman drops got you running into walls every two seconds, but boy oh boy does she look beautiful. Number one, paper dresses. This short-lived fad was introduced in the 1960s. It was a good one, it was exactly what you think. Paper dresses, nice, paper Mario in real life. Finally, I've always wanted this. I could already feel the paper cuts. Ah, what did I admire this ought to be? Here we go. Paper dresses to go, go. That was the phrase they like to use. They said the word go twice, therefore must be a good product. The Scott Paper Company made these not expecting the reaction that it got. It caught on quickly, of course. It only took six months for this casual paper company to start selling more than half a million paper dresses. Just out of nowhere, they're like, oh, let's just try this, and then it worked. It went so well that other companies hopped on board, just like the propeller hats. Over $3 million were spent on this awful fad. Andy Warhol was even in on the mix. It was a big deal. Everybody wanted to be involved. They weren't made of flimsy printer paper. It wasn't as bad as I'm making it sound, but it certainly wasn't great either. The dress was made of disposable material called Duraweave, you know, before it was cool to make things out of disposable materials. Believe it or not, it was slightly water and slightly fire resistant. Unlike those puffy middle-aged dresses that immediately go woom and then they don't exist anymore. This one was a little bit better. It was took the flame a little bit of time, right? It's been compared to the thick paper bib that you get at the dentist. Yeah, you know that horrible material that bunches up and pokes your neck mid-root canal while Kyle's doing stuff? It's made of that. Fun. We love history. We love beautiful fashion history. Number 10, Chopin's. These ancient slippers-ish shoes were used for more than just throwing at the heads of your unruly teenagers. Imagine catching a hardwood 14-inch Chopin uh, across your butt, throwing at you like a 90-mile fastball. Solid wood, too. Just a huge block, just <laughs> Originally worn and seen on the women in the 15th and 16th and 17th century Italy and France, these huge platform heels were designed for sliding over your shoes and socks to keep them dry and clean from the mud and the muck. Rule of thumb was, hire the Chopin, hire the class. Most of the time, these platform shoes are so high that you would need an assistant just to help you get around. Yeah. No, I don't. I wanna go this way, please. Thank you. Walking all over the place like Gene Simmons, 14 feet high. 
Great way to roll your ankle. Sometimes embroidered or lined with gems and jewels, these shoes were purely decorative and pretty impractical, as you can, as you can see. No one's walking up a spiral staircase in those things. No thanks. Number nine, head cones. Egyptologists have decoded the 14th century BCE paintings about these mysterious caps worn on the heads of certain women in ancient Egypt. First assumed it was of religious or ceremonial wear and tear, researchers and archaeologists think that they've cracked the code finally. It's actually a big wad of sticky beeswax. Yeah, but it smells nice. A perfume. This ball of specific gunk sat under the cap, sitting on the crown of the head that under the sun, over the course of the day, would cleanse the body with pleasant smells. Mostly stuffed with either beeswax or animal fat, and then packed with your favorite pleasant smelling herbs and flowers. The cap would then slowly melt on top of your head and would just drip down into the hair and down the body all day, slowly releasing a cologne shampoo hybrid sort of thing. Some were even stuffed with essential oils for the skin. And it wasn't just putting in fennel on your head at the end of the day, huh? That's nice. As of now, researchers have only been able to find women wearing these deodorant hats and paintings and carvings, and have yet to find a man wearing these ancient eau de toilettes. Ah uh, yes, the scent of a man. Ladies, look over here. And now here. I smell disgusting. Number eight, chatelaines. These practical and very decorative accessories have been used since the 18th and 19th centuries. A deadly yet decorative fashion ending in the Victorian era. Typically a chain made of metal, usually silver, bronze, or brass, and hung from the waistband, riddled with tools and trinkets, attached to it for your everyday use. Cobblers would have cobbler stuff, dentists would have dentist stuff. Basically this was just a cool belt chain on your jeans. Like a giant multi-tool on a keychain. Everything from vials with smelling salts, whistles, to even knives and protective devices. Just a giant set of janitor keys with different tools on it. I feel like this definitely gave way to the Swiss Army knife. Uh, Flathead or Robinson. Oh, I got a Phillips if you need. A Phillips? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It was mobile, decorative, and personal. I'm surprised we don't have these right now. I mean, I would use it. Mine would have like 11 chapsticks on it, just all in a row, you know? Number seven, cloaks. These mobile sleeping bags have been worn as far back as ancient Greece and ancient Mesopotamia. Made out of anything from fur to wool, these usually neck to foot length portable blankets were seen as both practical and decorative. One of the most used and reused clothing technologies. I can understand why such a simple piece of material can be used for so many different things. Protect you from most elements, camouflage you when hiding, and you could pretty much make these yourselves. Some people added hoods and pockets to theirs. Harry Potter gets it, Batman gets it. These people got it. Cloaks, capes, magicians' uniforms. We still use these things to this day. We gotta bring these back with youngins. Just Dracula capes someone on an exit? I mean, that's like the new mic drop. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you this weekend. Number six, togas. Much like the cloak, a very simple and ageless garment. A loose fitting sheet typically wrapped and folded across a person's body, seen as far back and popularized by ancient Romans. These common eggshell white dresses were used as general garb by both men and women of all classes. Think about how much red wine they would spill on these. Apparently they were big drinkers back then. Uh, sorry, do you have any club soda? Yeah, just, just don't dab it, please just blot it. Thank you. <laughs> and these things were huge too. You almost always needed help wrapping yourself up like a burrito. <sighs> Hurry up. Usually young boys would wear purple until they were a man. If you were mourning, then you would wear dark colors, and if you were in state, you would have the typical white toga, possibly with some colorful embroidery for some class. Pretty easy, you have like three choices. No more throwing clothes on and on before school. No, not that, I wore that last week. Can I see the white again? This garment was eventually abandoned by women, and then the lower class, and then the upper class, and then eventually men just really wore them at frat parties. Toga, toga. Yo, Raven Romulus, bro, you're nuts, man. Number five, Krakows. A popular shoe first originating in what is now Poland, the Krakow, gets its name from exactly this place, Krakow. Or also known as Poulain shoes were worn from roughly the 13th century to the 17th century by men and women of all classes. Multi-sizable, the long pointed shoe would have been sewn to a point and just rounded at the tip. The first use, of course, was merely decorative, stuffed at the toes with usually moss or hay. As time went on, the fashion trend took off and more and more people were just designing long, stinky socks. 
Just 1420 muddy England with no arch support, slipping and sliding all over the streets. How bad did they smell too? No socks, just foot on shoe rubbing? Ew. And you know they weren't clipping those toenails. I bet they were just curled up underneath them. Ew. I guess these would have been good for all shoe sizes. Kind of like a one shoe fits all your whole life kind of deal. Typically made out of wool or leather, these could be also crafted into metal and fitted for a night. Like swords aren't scary enough. Now I gotta dodge your pointy knife boot attack? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Number four, powdered wigs. The powdered wig or periwig, most famously coined after Louis XIV started this up and coming trend. As far back as the 1600s, we've seen these paintings of men and women with huge white hairdos. You're thinking, that's a lot of hairspray and a lot of stress. Well, actually it wasn't even their hair. In fact, most men and women were balding underneath during these times. Yeah. Syphilis, good one. Syphilis was the most popular of STDs and one of the common side effects was patchy balding hair, also blisters and also sores. With the plague constantly knocking on the door, cleanliness and class was upheld in values more than anything. The powder, consisting mostly of starch and lavender, was used to powder wigs and rid them of odors, stains and even bugs? Dude, I'm getting itchy reading this. That's right, a ton of bugs, usually in the form of lice, would be attracted to these wigs and most of the time were infested even before their first wear. Worn by all classes, the powdered wig is an icon in fashion. It's used through so many centuries by so many different people. Just coughing nonstop while shaving your head so you don't get fleas. Shaking the ants out of your head before the big dance. <laughs> The common price for a decent wig would cost about a week's worth of wages. Of course, the upper class spending much higher price for larger and better quality pieces, coining the term big wigs. The rich and their bad hair pieces. Like it's jet black, you're 89, dude, let it go. Number three, chain mail. Worn from third century BC to about 16th century AD, historians point us in the direction of Celtics in Europe for the initial use and design of this shiny metal shirt. From the word burni, the chainmail is one of the most widely known lightweight mobile armors people could really wear for one's safety. One of the most useful and practical sets of wardrobe designed for mostly military personnel, the chainmail, or commonly known as mail, was a lattice grid consisting of tightly fitted metal loops to form an almost knitted poncho, hood, sleeve, you name it, they made it. This item of clothing would be custom fitted to your body and worn all day. I bet you'd be pretty tired because most of the time, a full jumper of mail was about 50 pounds. In the rain and the mud, that's heavy. And in the rain too, like did they ever get electrocuted? You're basically a giant metal golf club on top of a castle fighting with sharper metal golf clubs. Zeus just chucking thunderbolts down at you and you're just trying to keep your head up. Number two, cod pieces. Jock, dance belt, the old stuff the sock trick. These guys did it first. And I say guys, cause guys, men definitely created this. Uh, yeah, I'll take the uh, bigger size. The, the, big, the big one, hurry up please, hurry up. Size mattered back then and size of one's cod mattered. A piece of fashion designed for both safety and for boasting. Getting dressed was hard back then and you didn't want to get your bits all caught up in any material. So the answer was the 15th century cod piece made out of metal, wood, or leather. The cod piece was fitted around a man's stuff and securely tied to his waist belt or pantalones, either under or over his clothes. Some believe this was designed due to the waistlines rising and the shortening of one's jacket over the years revealing more and more of the goods. Sometimes to show off, sometimes for battle, and much like the modern jock, it did serve numerous protection reasons, but was mostly seen at the time as a fashion statement. Again, size and reputation mattered, and flaunting was all part of the 15th, 16th century culture. Louis XIV knows what's up. And step will change, sire. And number one. Macaroni. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Yeah, that's a real song, dude. I thought my neighbor Declan made that up playing road hockey when I was eight. Near the end of the 18th century and one of Europe's most heightened times, also known as the Age of Enlightenment, was an eclectic group of people called the Macaronis. No, not the delicious noodle, but instead a group of young men flamboyantly pushing the boundaries of fashion to even trolling it. Huh. These men were mocking the style and in that created another style. Yeah, that's pretty gangster, dude. 
Basically, you would wear the biggest wig you had and on top, a tiny miniature hat and a feather. Just a cute little guy. Someone was definitely trying to make their friend laugh and then it just worked. This high slang term for high fashion is thought to have originated from the elegantly dressed Italian immigrants. Elegantly noted Italian men boasting about how perfect their macaroni pasta was and throwing about the term for everything they liked or adored as macaroni. Wow, I love your shoes, they're so macaroni. Yeah, your hair's like so macaroni. It's like really macaroni, you know what I mean? The sillier and more elegant and more vibrant, the better. Men would have to walk around with ceiling high wigs, the balance alone. Okay, okay, there we go. It was a time to show off. And the coolest part, macaroni style was genderless. Men and women could borrow and mix mash styles at this point in history and people were digging it. It was like the 80s of the century. Well, I guess that's literally the 80s at some point. Vibrant colors, glitz and glamor, you name it, they wore it. And that's why I feel the macaronis deserve the number one spot here. Just the name alone, man, come on. Number nine, the hobble skirt. Here we go, we're gonna slowly walk like penguins for this one. Just from this 1910 headline alone, the hobble skirt sounds like a good time. The June 12 headline reads, the hobble is the latest freak in women fashion. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Doesn't that pull you in? I want one already, let's do it, let's. French designer Paul Poré made these to free the bust while shackling the legs. Just what you need to move around on uneven stone roads back hundreds of years ago. We love it. Love the practicality of the outfit. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and is, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons like losers. Ha, what are you, walking? So they could actually walk around, you know? What a weird thing to do. These hobble skirts were worn by the, you know, the fancy and they were like, Mm, we don't walk, we're too fancy for that. We'll just stand in one place and do this a lot. And also this, I guess. I don't know what this is. These hobble skirts were so popular at the time that upper class folks sought out a new fashion trend that made them look even fancier than the rest. So they just did it for clout. And they look stupid. I'll say, it. they look kind of stupid. Number seven, the hoop skirt. The hoop skirt is way too much. I mean, for starters, it looks like something you would find on a playground. Children can for sure do chin ups on the hoop skirt. These skirts were six foot wide, like hoops. They were the talk of the town. Would have been perfect for the pandemic, actually, six by six. Nice. They were the talk of the town around the 1700s, and it was often handmade from whalebone or basket willow. And if you attended King Louis XVI's court, it might as well be a packed bar. You're sneaking by everybody, these small passageways between people and their now six foot hoop radius skirts. It's not, not practical at all, but they did look fancy. Later on in the mid 1800s, a newer version of the skirt came out and these were better because they were made of steel. I'm not joking. This was considered new and or improved. They could produce these more often now being made of steel. So this was really the first time in history where your legs could also actually move around while you looked good. We went from hobble skirts to cage skirts. I think we're getting better. I think maybe. Number five, wax cones. This next one we need to bring back. I'm tired of washing my beanie. It smells, you don't want to know, honestly. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. We're going way back for this one. They would sit on top of your head, and back in 2019, we actually found evidence that they were in fact used. Before then, we just saw them on paintings and such. What would happen is men and women would wear this cone, and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone, and the cone itself was made of oils, fats, resins, and it would be placed on their wig or directly on their head to make them smell better as the day went by. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. Number two, bombasting. The origin of stuffing your bra, let's do it. Mr. Boombastic, is it fantastic after all? What does it even mean to call somebody Boombastic? What is this? Well, back in the 16th century, if you looked like a literal couch, you were considered royalty. The bigger the belly, the bigger the arms, the bigger the everything, the better. Size mattered a lot back then. Men and women would stuff cotton, wool, or sawdust. Yeah, they would stuff sawdust in their clothing to appear more muscular or to seem like they ate a lot. Now it's so funny because while of course this makes sense in history and stuff, like I just mentioned, the legs of these guys were always so hmm, tiny. They would more often than not make their arms look ripped and their bellies huge, but they still needed to move around and be like, ah oh, yes, and like, you know, that whole my lady stuff. A guy the size of a minivan isn't intimidating. It looks more uncomfortable than anything. And in case you're wondering, yes, men would usually stuff just one part of their trousers. That's just false advertising, my friend. And finally, number one, bustles. All that junk inside your trunk, what are you going to do with it? 
Saving my personal favorite for last, of course, bustles were a fun little mix of everything on this list. This was also known as the Grecian Bend. It came to town in the 1870s. Now remember how we'd wear cage dresses that extended six feet and was just not practical in any way? Well, they modified that so it was basically just your behind that was poofed out. This fabric was draped behind the butt. That was the, uh, uh, uh. The fabric was usually draped behind the butt. That was the original style, but some people got smart and began stuffing the back just to make it, you know, a little higher, a little bit bigger, a little more, hmm, a little more, mm, to it. And then eventually, you look like an absolute dump truck. So some eyes were facing you, which was a bonus back then. The bustle, looking back at it, pun intended, is ridiculous. This was not comfortable or practical at all. It began as a small piece of fabric that would hold the dress up, and then it became this. Whenever I see this style, I always think of Aunt Fanny from the movie Robots. That movie is criminally underrated. I'm gonna end on that thought. Go watch Robots.